This lecture is on alcohols, ethers, and epoxides, and we're just going to be talking about um, their general properties and nomenclature. <clears throat> An alcohol is essentially defined by having that oxygen-hydrogen bond. And of course, the other bond to oxygen will be to some alkyl group, so some kind of carbon chain. An ether is an oxygen that's bonded to two carbon groups. They could be the same carbon group or different carbon groups. And that's indicated by the prime here that this R group could be different from that one. <clears throat> a new functional group for us is an epoxide. An epoxide is really a cyclic ether, but it's a special case. It's a three atom cyclic ether where specifically one of those atoms is oxygen and the other two are carbons. Now bonded to those carbons can be either hydrogens or carbon groups. And so they could be four different carbon groups or any mixture of carbon groups um, and hydrogens. For all of these oxygens, since they're, you know, they only have sigma bonds, they're sp3 hybridized oxygens. And so that means they're going to prefer 109 degree bond angle. And so that's typically what you'll find with alcohols and ethers. It'll be somewhere close to 109.5 degrees. However, with an epoxide, due to that triangle uh, geometry, <clears throat> this angle is essentially constricted to being 60 degrees. <clears throat> and so with epoxides, They are highly strained rings. <clears throat> and so this is a special case that will give them special reactivity that we'll investigate later in this chapter. And this is similar to what we saw with cyclopropane rings, where that ring structure is not very stable due to that ring strain or that angle strain. In terms of physical properties, all of these are going to have strong dipole-dipole type interactions because of the very polar carbon-oxygen bond. But of course also you'll have hydrogen bonding uh, prevalent with alcohols due to the OH bond as a, as a protic bond, or protic molecule. <clears throat> So over here we can look at a couple examples that showcase their physical properties. And we'll just look at boiling point. And so this takes us back to the beginning of the semester. But so here's three molecules. Two of them are constitutional isomers. Another one is just very close in um, size and molecular weight. So we're comparing an alkane, an ether, and an alcohol. The alkane, since it only has access to van der Waals um, interactions, has the lowest boiling point. And in this case, uh, for butane, it's zero degrees Celsius. For our ether here, due to those dipole-dipole uh, interactions, we have a higher boiling point, so the molecules will stick together a little bit stronger. When hydrogen bonding is involved, we can see that the boiling point goes up tremendously as the molecules are really stuck together with much stronger intermolecular forces. Also, specifically about hydrogen bonding, it can be weaker with sterically hindered alcohols. And I'll show you some examples of what this means. So 
So here we have three constitutional isomers, all of them are alcohols. We've got a tertiary, a secondary, and a primary alcohol. <clears throat> and so the, this high degree of branching near that OH means it'll be a little bit more congested if it's trying to form a hydrogen bond with another molecule. And that'll weaken that bond as things are bumping into each other around that. And this manifests itself in the boiling point. The stronger the hydrogen bonding, the higher the boiling point will be. Now, of course, that's one factor involved in these boiling points. Also, just the degree of branching that affects the total surface area is also a factor. And we know that with more surface area, you also expect a higher boiling point. So both of those factors are in play in these examples. This has the highest surface area, but also the least hindered OH group in terms of essentially beta branching. <clears throat> In naming alcohols, um, whenever you have an alcohol functional group, this will take priority over any other kind of functional group um, that we've encountered or will encounter in this chapter. And so what you want to look for is to give priority to that OH group in um, defining your parent chain and also um, when you're numbering um, that, the carbon atoms in that chain. And we'll see examples of this. And so a three carbon chain is just propane. To name an alcohol, you'll drop the E and you'll replace it with all. And so propane just becomes propanol. Now the number out in front tells us where that alcohol group is. And so we're going to number our chain such to give the alcohol group the lowest possible number. And so this would be 1 propanol. Alternatively, this 1 can also go right in front of the all. <laughs> and for simple molecules, it makes less sense to do it this way, it makes the pronunciation of the name a little more difficult, but it'd be propan, one, all. Um, but either of these are acceptable. <clears throat> and so there's another propanol that's out there, and that would be this molecule. And so instead of being one propanol, we still have a three carbon chain that contains the alcohol bonded to it, but we have to number from one of the ends, and we'll number such to give this the lowest number. It won't matter which side we number from, either way, we would encounter that alcohol group at the second carbon. And so this would be 2 propanol, or propan 2 all. Either one's acceptable.
And so we can practice some basic nomenclature with these three examples. Uh, the first thing you want to do is identify the longest alcohol containing chain. And so here in this example, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. We want to number that chain such to give the OH group the lowest number. So you notice from this end, we encounter a methyl substituent on the second carbon. From this end, we encounter the OH on the third carbon. However, because the OH gets priority over all other substituents, we're only concerned with giving the OH the lower number possible. And so we'll number from this end. And so this is the first time you know, we're looking at a, a, a case where we're not going to compare different substituents. Um, we'll always focus on the OH, and that makes things easier. <clears throat> and so after we number this way, the OH will be part of the parent name. So if it's a seven carbon chain, that'd be heptane. If it's an alcohol, it'll be heptanol. And so this will be 6-methyl-3-heptanol. And so again, you could also put this 3 right in front of the all. Um, but that's a little less common, but it would work as well. Down here, the longest carbon chain is actually a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 carbon chain. But that carbon chain does not have the alcohol directly bonded to it. And so the carbon chain we're going to choose will be the longest OH containing carbon chain. So this would be a 6 carbon chain. Off the second carbon would be a one, two, three carbon propyl group. And so this will be two propyl, one hexanol. So we're always dropping the E, replacing that with all. Down here you can have cyclic alcohols as well. We'll number it such to give the alcohol the lowest number. And then we have a chloro substituent versus an ethyl substituent. Chloro comes first alphabetically, and so we'll number it this way. <clears throat> now we have two different substituents. Put them in alphabetical order. We would have two chloro, six ethyl, one cyclo. Hexanol. So remember the cyclo, because it was cyclohexane, it becomes cyclohexanol. Of course, molecules can exist that have more than one alcohol group on them. And this is an example of the simplest diol. This is ethylene glycol. That's its common name. <clears throat> and this is like a standard component of antifreeze or engine coolant. <clears throat> But again, the, we're interested in the IUPAC name. So if you have more than one alcohol group on the molecule, you'll number the one. You'll, they have equal priority, so you'll prioritize them based on which one comes sooner in the carbon chain or at the lower number, just like you would any other kind of substituent. And so here, no matter what, one's going to be a number one. So you can just number your chain one, two. If it's a diol, just like we had dimethyl or trimethyl groups, then we'll use that same pre prefix di in the name. And so in this case, 
for pronunciation, when you have a diol or a triol, you keep the E in the parent chain. So it's a two carbon chain, so it's ethane. And since there's two alcohol groups, the di goes right before the all, so this would be ethane diol. Now to describe their locations on the chain, we can put the numbers out front, or they could be put right before the die um, in the middle of the name, but that's a little less common. So here's two, two examples um, of molecules with multiple alcohol groups. <clears throat> you might want to go ahead and try and name these um, in pencil, and you can erase if it's incorrect, and see what you come up with. But go ahead and pause the screen and try it, and I'll go over them. So if we look at this one, we number from this end, this will be carbon number one. That carbon chain that we pick should include both alcohols, and it obviously does. And so we've got a seven carbon chain, so this would be a heptane diol. But we've also got a methyl substituent on the fifth carbon. So this will be five methyl one comma three to indicate the position of the two alcohols. Heptane diol. So remember if it's a diol or a triol, we keep that E. In this case here, we just want to number these so you get the lowest numbers possible. And so if we number this way, with this being carbon number one, two, three, and four, we'll have the lowest possible numbers for our three alcohols. And so this molecule would be simply one, two, four, cyclohexane tri all to indicate that there's three alcohol groups present. Okay, so now we're moving on to ether nomenclature. For ethers, the common names 
are actually used more widely than the IUPAC names. And so this is pretty much the only case we'll, we'll learn common names. Um, many ethers are solvents, um, and they're just referred to by their common name. So we'll learn both how to name, both ways of naming ethers. <coughs> Common names will generally only apply to pretty simple molecules. And so the way you do it is you name both alkyl groups bonded to the oxygen, and then you arrange that alphabetically. So for example, we've got a methyl group, a one carbon chain bonded to oxygen, and then a two carbon chain, an ethyl group. And so ethyl become, comes alphabetically before methyl. And so this one would be ethyl space methyl ether. And so in common names, there's spaces more prevalent than in IUPAC. So definitely a space between ethyl and methyl, and a space between methyl and ether. <clears throat> this molecule is probably the most uh, common ether out there. It's an incredibly common solvent. Since both alkyl groups are ethyl groups, instead of saying ethyl, ethyl ether, it's called diethyl ether to indicate there's two ethyl groups. Just as you know, something to be aware of, diethyl ether is also commonly referred to as ethyl ether or just ether. So if somebody asks for ether as a solvent, they're specifically talking about diethyl ether. It's by far the most common one used. Over here, this is a, actually a, a very, very common gasoline additive. Um, and you can see it has a T-butyl group and a methyl group. That T in tertiary butyl counts towards the alphabetizing. And so this is methyl space T-butyl ether. <clears throat> For IUPAC naming, the rules are a little different. IUPAC naming, uh, the simpler alkyl chain and the oxygen are named as an alkoxy group. And so the only time you'll see these are with relatively short or straight, not, you know, not very branched, or really only see you know, unbranched alkyl chains um, bonded to the oxygen. And these are easy to convert to an alkoxy group. So for example, a very common um, alkoxy group shown here, just an oxygen with a methyl group, and this could be bonded, this does not indicate a negative charge, but bonded to uh, some other larger, more complicated structure. But since it's a methyl chain bonded to the oxygen, this is called a methoxy group. So an alkyl group is converted to an alkoxy group. So we drop the YL and substitute oxy so this is a methoxy group. Down here, if it's a two carbon chain, that would be an ethoxy group. 
down here it's a T-butyl group would be the, the alkyl component bonded to oxygen. And so this would be a T-butoxy group if we're naming it um, as an ether. <clears throat> and so that alkoxy group uh, actually is given less priority than alkyl substituents or essentially the same priority. So when you go to name it as a substituent, so here when we say group, also substituent, if we're thinking about a branch on a chain, it gets low priority, definitely much lower than an alcohol. And so when we look at these possibilities, we can name them according to IUPAC rules. And so the IUPAC name, I'll just draw in red, So we've got a methyl group and an ethyl group. The methyl would be the simpler group, it's less carbons. And so we'll name this as a substituent on this as the parent chain. So if this is the parent chain, because it's the longest carbon chain, this would be carbon number one and carbon number two, because carbon one has the substituent on it. And so the IUPAC name, since this is a methoxy group, would be 1-methoxy ethane. And really, the, the one's not necessary because you could only have it on one spot in ethane. <clears throat> in this case, if they're the same carbon chain, you just have to name one of them as the ethoxy part and one as the parent ethane. And so this would be Ethane. Over here, a methyl group would be a simpler chain than this branched chain. And so this will be your methoxy group or substituent. And then over here, you have different options that are all identical, but it'll be a three carbon chain. So I'll just number one, two, three. You notice that both substituents are on carbon number two. So we have a methyl group and a methoxy. Methoxy comes alphabetically before methyl. So this would be 2-methoxy, 2-methyl-propane. So it's propane because that's the longest chain. And we're naming the ether and the alkyl substituents um, as substituents. And so we can do two more examples, and that will be it. try and name these. You can pause it and see what you come up with and we'll go over them. Obviously the last one will be a bit complicated and involve alcohol nomenclature as well. For this first one, the larger or substituent or the alkyl group with more carbons is the cyclohexane ring. And so we'll name this as the alkoxy substituent. And so it's a one, two, three carbon chain. So that would be not a propyl group, but a propoxy group. And so this would just be Proxy cyclohexane. You don't need the one out in front if there's only one substituent. It wouldn't, wouldn't be terribly incorrect if you put the one in there. It's just not necessary. Over here, we've got an alcohol group, which gets the highest priority. And we've got a methoxy group and two methyl groups. And 
so the methoc the alcohol group will be carbon number one. Then as we number in either direction, carbon number two um, would be this way since we encounter a substituent. <clears throat> and we can number around the ring. This will be a cyclopentane, so it'll be a cyclopentanol. And then we've got three substituents to worry about. Methyls will come alphabetically after methoxy. And so this is two methoxy. Whoop. Four four dimethyl. One. I run out of room, so I'm just going to continue it with that hyphen. Cyclopentanol. 